Lord, I thank you once again, Father, Lord, that, um, that you've brought us here, God. I thank you for hearing our prayers that we just prayed. Lord God, I pray all honor and glory be to your name. God, I just thank you, but I thank you again for all the trials that you have allowed me and allowed us to go through, Lord, that they have just worked a great thing, Father God. I thank you for your correction and chastisement, God, that you've worked the peaceable fruit of righteousness in us. Lord, I pray for this morning that the power of your Holy Spirit may rest upon me, that I may rightly divide your word, and that your sheep will be fed well, Lord, corrected where correction is needed. Lord, we do pray that you'd bring in your harvest, Lord, that we'd stand strong against the, the false movements, against the Pharisees and Sadducees of this age. And Lord, I pray that you would be our first love. God, please be with us. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to be in the book of Isaiah this morning. We're going to do chapter 31 in chapter 32. Now, we're going to see, and you have been seeing this as we go through the book of Isaiah, is that Isaiah is confronting sin, talking about punishment, but there's a lot of talk about the kingdom of God, the kingdom that they're anticipating. And yes, you enter that kingdom by being born again, but there's yet a yet future kingdom where Jesus Christ is going to rule and reign. And Isaiah, by the Holy Spirit, by the will of God, continually gives them this message of repent, judgment's coming, but there's also a coming kingdom. So we're Isaiah chapter 32 and 33, chapters 32 and 33. Behold, a king will reign in righteousness, and princes will rule with justice. A man will be as a hiding place from the wind, and a cover from the tempest as rivers of water in a dry place, as a shadow of a great rock in a weary land. The eyes of those who see will not be dim, and the ears of those who hear will listen. Also the heart of the rash will understand knowledge, and the tongue of the stammerers will be ready to speak plainly. The foolish person will no longer be called generous, nor the miser said to be bountiful. For the foolish person will speak foolishness, and his heart will work iniquity, to practice ungodliness, to utter error against the Lord, to keep the hungry unsatisfied, and will cause the drink of the thirsty to fail. Also the schemes of the schemer are evil. He devises wicked plans to destroy the poor with lying words, even when the needy speaks justice. But a generous man devises generous things, and by generosity he will stand. Rise up, you women who are at ease. Hear my voice, you complacent daughters. Give ear to my speech. In a year and some days you will be troubled, you complacent women. For the vintage will fail and the gathering will not come. Tremble, you women who are at ease. Be troubled, you complacent ones. Strip yourselves, make yourselves bare. Gird sackcloth on your waists. People shall mourn upon their breasts for the pleasant fields for the fruitful vine. On the land of my people will come up thorns and briars. Yes, all of the happy homes in the joyous city. Because the palaces will be forsaken, the, the bustling city will be deserted, the forts and towers will become lairs forever, a joy of wild donkeys, a pasture of flocks, until the Spirit is poured upon us from on high, and the wilderness becomes a fruitful field, and a fruitful field a counted forest. Then justice will dwell in the wilderness, and righteousness will remain in the fruitful field. The work of righteousness will be peace, and the effect of righteousness, quietness, and assurance forever. My people will dwell in a peaceful habitation, in secure dwellings, and in quiet resting places. Though hail come down in the forest, and the city is brought low in humiliation, blessed are those who sow besides all waters, who send out freely to the feet of the ox and the donkey. We're going to stop there in our reading, go back to verse 1 of chapter 32. So it starts out dealing with the kingdom. It says, Behold, a king will reign in righteousness, and princes will rule with justice. There's a king. There's a prophecy to Israel. There is a king that is going to come that is prophesied about that will reign in righteousness. And, and this is why the Jews had such an anticipation of the kingdom of God when Jesus showed up. See, to the King David, there was promised an everlasting kingdom. In 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 16, Nathan speaks to David and says, In your house and your kingdom shall be established forever before you. Your throne shall be established forever. According to all these words and according to all this vision, so Nathan spoke to David. To David it was promised that there was going to be an everlasting throne, an everlasting kingdom from the line of David. So there's this promise that the Jews were anticipating that we got a king coming. And they waited for that king. 
Jesus is that king. And when he came his first time, they thought the kingdom is going to be established, but it wasn't then. Back in Matthew chapter 9, it says, When Jesus departed from there, two blind men followed him, crying out and saying, Son of David, have mercy on us. These blind men knew that he was that son of David, that he was from the lineage of David, that he was that Messiah, that king that was to come in and bring in everlasting righteousness. In Matthew chapter 21 and verse 9, it says, And the multitudes who went out before those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna. Save us, son of David. Save us now. Save us now, king. They knew that Jesus was that king. In Mark chapter 12, Jesus answered and said while he taught in the temple, How is it that the scribes say that the Christ is the son of David? The Christ, that means the Messiah. How does the scribes say that the Messiah is the son of David? For David himself said by the Holy Spirit, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore, David himself calls him Lord. How then, or how is he then his son? And the common people heard him gladly. They heard him gladly. They got it. Well, so he can't literally just be another human, although Jesus was fully God, but he had to be somebody else. He had to be the Lord. He is both fully man and fully God. Yes, from the lineage of David, but he's more than just another human. He's more than just from the lineage of David. He's from the lineage of God the Father. Without mother, without father, without beginning, without end, as it tells about us in Hebrews, Melchizedek. That is Jesus Christ. It says, Behold, a king will reign in righteousness, and princes will rule with justice. And this is a prophecy to the Jews, that there's going to be this king that reigns in righteousness. And we are, as Christians today, to look forward to this kingdom. They knew that Jesus is that son of David. What they did not understand is that there'd be this gap called the church age, then the tribulation period, then the kingdom age, the thousand-year reign of Jesus Christ on earth, the thousand-year reign of the son of David. Many times today, you hear the false churches talk about, well, I'm all about the kingdom of God. And you're like, well, what kingdom are we talking about? Many of them are talking about the kingdom of this world, where there really isn't any righteousness, where Satan is the little g God of this world, and they're all about setting up the kingdom of God here and now. Many of those of the Reformed theology are all about that because they came out of Roman Catholicism and carried over much of the doctrines of Roman Catholicism right into Reformed theology. Believe that the church is here to set up the kingdom. No, we're waiting for that king who will rule in righteousness, that true righteous king. And be careful as Christians right now because the Antichrist will be a person that appears to set up some type of kingdom of God on earth. We won't be here to see the Antichrist, but we will be seeing the establishment of it to say, the groundwork being laid. He will be a friend of the Jewish people. He will be a friend of the harlot church. He will bring the faiths together. It will be the kingdom of God in many ways. But that is not the kingdom of righteousness. It'll have to be a kingdom without much judgment because judgment causes division. So you're not going to be able to judge between right and wrong. As long as we say that we're all believers in God, as long as we say that we're all white hats, against, as long as you're against child trafficking and things like that, well, we can all come together. Be careful because that's not the true kingdom of righteousness. The kingdom of righteousness is when Jesus Christ is back ruling and reigning on earth. It says, Behold, a king will reign in righteousness, and princes will rule with justice. There's going to be people ruling with Jesus Christ with justice. True, good politics to say. There's going to be a king. He's going to have princes with him. They're going to rule with justice. A king of righteousness ruling with justice. Who's going to rule with them? Well, the Bible implies that you and I will. Please turn with me to Luke chapter 19. And we'll start in verse 11. This is a parable, but it does allude to the fact that if you are faithful to God, that when he returns and sets up his kingdom, that you will be ruling and reigning with him. In Luke chapter 19, starting in verse 11. Now as they heard these things, he spoke another parable, because he was near Jerusalem, and because they thought the kingdom of God would appear immediately. So what's everyone thinking? Well, the kingdom of God is about to appear. The, the Messiah is here. The son of David has shown up. 
They thought the kingdom of a God was about to appear immediately. It's here. We're so excited. It's here. Well, Jesus is going to correct that for me. It's not going to be immediate. It's going to be a while. He's going to go away and come back. And when he comes back, those that were faithful will rule and reign with him. Verse 12. Therefore, he said, a certain noble man went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. This noble man's going away and he's coming back. Jesus Christ, who was going to go away, he's going to come back. So he called 10 of his servants and delivered them 10 minas. And he said to them, do business till I come. So he gives them these minas. Their job is to do business with what the master gave them. As we are to do business to say we are to do God's work with what he gives us. But his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, we will not have this man reign over us. So the servants are getting backlash because of their master. And right now there's a difference between the servants and the citizens. Right now we are servants of God here proclaiming that, yes, our king is coming back. He's going to rule and reign. First come back for the church, rapture us out here, but he's coming back to set up his kingdom. And there's a lot of people in this world, a lot of citizens who hate our master. Verse 15, and so it was that when he returned, because Jesus Christ will return, having received the kingdom, he then commanded these servants to whom he had given the money to be called to him that he might know how much every man had gained from, by trading. And then he came, then came the first saying, master, your mind has earned 10 minas. And he said to him, well done, good servant, because you were faithful in a very little, have authority over 10 cities. So there's a parable that, yes, Jesus will come back, but when he comes back, those who were faithful are going to rule with him. They're going to rule in the kingdom. You were faithful with what God gave you, rule over 10 cities. And the second came saying, Master, your mina has earned five minas. Likewise, he said to him, you also be over five cities. Then another came saying, Master, here is your mina, which I have kept. Put away in your handkerchief. For I feared you because you were an auster man and collect what you did not deposit and reap what you did not sow. This servant doesn't really know his master. He thinks he knows his master. He's actually telling his master, this is what you're like. But he doesn't know his master. And he said to him, out of your own mouth, I will judge you, you wicked servant. You knew that I was an auster man collecting what I did not deposit and reaping what I did not sow. Why then did you not put my money in the bank? that at my coming I might have collected it with interest. And he said to those who stood by, take the mina from him and give it to him who has ten minas. But they said to a master, he has ten minas. For I say to you that to everyone who has will be given, and from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. But bring here those enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them and slay them before me. So everyone that rejected this king gets killed. And also the one who was supposedly the servant, but was not really serving the master is not part of the kingdom. So if you go back with me to Isaiah chapter 32 and verse one, it says, behold, a king will reign in righteousness and princes will rule with justice. I do believe those princes to be the church. Those that are faithful servants of God will rule in justice with this righteous king, Jesus Christ. Verse 2. A man will be as a hiding place from the wind, and a cover from the tempest, a rivers of water in a dry place, and as a shadow of a great rock in a weary land. These people that rule, these men that are ruling, will be like a hiding place from the wind, a cover from the tempest, rivers of water in a dry place, a shadow of a great rock in a weary land. It's going to be good leadership. The eyes of those who see will not be dim, and the ears of those who hear will listen. And also the heart of the rash will understand knowledge, and the tongue of the stammerers will be ready to speak plainly. The foolish person will no longer be called generous, nor the miser be called bountiful. No longer will you have the foolish person be called generous, the fool who has said in his heart, there is no God, the wicked, such as Bill Gates. People think that this man is a philanthropist, that he gives and does all this. He's just a wicked man trying to depopulate the earth. The foolish man will no longer be called generous during the millennial reign, nor the miser said to be bountiful. 
For the foolish person will speak foolishness, and his heart will work iniquity to practice ungodliness, to utter error against the Lord, to keep the hungry unsatisfied, and he will cause the dark of the thirsty to fail, and also the schemes of the schemer are evil. He devises wicked plans to destroy the poor with lying words, even when the needy speaks justice. So, in verse 6 and 7, you're dealing with those who are wicked. Now, they will not be part of the kingdom. Verse 5 talks about the kingdom age. But then in verse 6 and 7, it just describes that these wicked people, they're not part of the kingdom. And the schemes of the schemers are evil. He devises wicked plans to destroy the poor with lying words. What do you think guys like Bill Gates are doing? Anthony Fauci, going after poor people too, just trying to destroy them. They go to third world countries, poor, dark-skinned people, and they do try to destroy them. Verse 8, but a generous man devises generous things, and by generosity he shall stand. We will stand. A true, generous man. A generous man devises generous things. And by generosity, he shall stand. He stands. It shows him, shows where the generous man's heart is. That they stand. They are true, righteous men. In Proverbs 11, verse 24, There is one who scatters, yet increases more. And there is one who withholds more than is right, but it leads to poverty. There's one, there's a generous man who devises generous things. He scatters, it says, yet increases more. And there is one who withholds more than is right, but it leads to poverty. Say, I, I got to hold on to this for myself. Holding on to it. I, I need this for me. And what happens? It leads to poverty. But the generous man who scatters, yet increases more. Isn't that something in the kingdom of God that that's how that works? Even right now, as you scatter you'll increase more. And even if you don't see a huge increase here, you're going to have a huge increase there. You will reap a harvest. The generous soul will be made rich, and he who waters also will be watered himself. Isn't it? The generous soul will be made rich, and he who waters will be watered himself. He who trusts in riches will fall, but the righteous will flourish like foliage. If you trust in riches, and in, in especially right now, as there's so much financial uncertainty, although right before the rapture, people will be buying, selling, trading, building, all those things. But it's not our job to trust in riches, to that this green rectangle or cryptocurrency or whatever it might be is going to take care of me. Don't trust in riches. Trust in the living God. And it tells us, but a generous man devises generous things, and by generosity, he shall stand. He stands. He stands right with God. The generous man stands right with God. It's not that the generosity saves a man. It's just reflective of who he is. He realizes that God has been so generous with him that now he is generous in return. That everything that he has is God's anyways. Remember the parable that we just read in Luke chapter 19 is that whatever we have was given to us from God. And so we're generous with knowing God has been generous with us. We are generous back. In 1 Timothy, verse 6, command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty nor to trust in uncertain riches but in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Let them do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share. Storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come. What are we called to do? We're called to store up a good foundation for the time to come, not here and now. And so much emphasis is about how can I prepare for here and now. No, it's about how can you prepare for the time to come? How can you prepare for the kingdom age right now? Not how are you preparing for tomorrow on earth? How are you preparing for the time to come in another kingdom? That, that's what our preparation here is about. If you just live the American way, it's all about, well, you got to prepare for your future here. As a pastor, I tell you, according to the Bible, according to God's word, it's about preparing for the time to come. It's about preparing for that kingdom age. It's going to come. And once you're there, you're there. That's it. There's no second chances. You're either there or you're not there. And you either got 10 cities or five cities or whatever it might be. You're there. That's it. That, that's your final destination. And right now is your opportunity to prepare for that. Yeah, you can't see it. That's why it takes faith. And it says, storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. That's what the Bible says. And it's not that giving saves. But the saved person is a giving person. It shows that they have laid hold on eternal life, that they get that this world is not my treasure. 
that the things here, they're going to perish. But I'm saving up for a time to come. And that's why in verse 8 of Isaiah 32, it says, But a generous man devises generous things, and by generosity he shall stand. By generosity he shall stand. Why? Because it shows that his heart was looking towards the kingdom of God. If you're a born-again Christian, you're going to look towards the kingdom of God. You're going to say, hey, look, there is a time to come. And I have met people over the years that sit there and, and, and they'll play the game, oh, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian, and yeah, I love God, they even want to argue with me about theology, but they don't store from the kingdom of heaven at all. It shows where they're really at. It shows that they don't really think about the kingdom of God, that they're most likely not even saved. If, if you're not storing up for the time to come, it shows that you're not really looking to the time to come. Some people might want to have a theological debate with me here and now about their rights to do certain sins, and they'll argue with me, and then you're like, but you're not even concerned about the kingdom of God. You act like you know about the kingdom of God. You are not even looking to the kingdom of God. Verse 9. Rise up, you women who are at ease. Hear my voice, you complacent daughters. Give ear to my speech. So now we're switching gears from the kingdom. Now Isaiah is rebuking the women of Jerusalem. Many times the rebuke goes to the men and to the leaders, but the Bible doesn't leave women out. Jerusalem has judgment coming. And here we have, it says, Rise up, you women are at ease. Hear my voice, you complacent daughters. Give ear to my speech. God's judgment's coming. The women were hearing the prophets as well. They knew that judgment was about to come. And they're at ease. God's calling them through the prophet Isaiah, rise up, do not be at ease. As if they were just complacent. They, everything was just okay, you complacent daughters, it says. Complacent, this is okay. This is life, I'll take it. But it wasn't the way it was supposed to be. And even if the men were going astray, even if the leaders were not doing what was right, they're called to rise up. And number one, the first thing every person is called to do, if you have faith in God, is to love God. Number one, rise up, you daughters of, you daughters who are at ease, you complacent daughters, you women who are at ease. And the number one thing you are to rise up and do is not to tell your man what to do. The number one thing you're to do is to love God. Rise up, love God, put God first. That is the first thing you rise up and do. Rise up, you woman who are at ease. And this is applicable today to the church age, to the complacent daughters. We live in a day and age where it is like the days of Lot, like Sodom and Gomorrah. It's like the days of Noah. And there are women that go to church on Sunday that claim to be women of God who are at ease. They're not seeking God. They're not really doing the things of God. They're just at ease. It's not anyone's job to be lazy or at ease. That, that is not a Christian's job. God wants us to do things. First and foremost, and I kind of emphasize this enough, is to love God. First and foremost, read your Bible pray, obey, do those things. And Titus it tells this to Titus, Paul speaking to him, but as for you, speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine, that the older men be sober, reverent, temperate, sound in the faith and love and patience, that this is proper for sound doctrine. This is sound doctrine. This is what you teach people to do in the church. And it says, the older women likewise, that they be reverent in behavior, not slanderers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, and that they admonish the young women to love their husbands and to love their children. That's not a woman at ease. That's a woman doing something. And we live in the last days. Women need to be doing something. They need to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers. A lot of women get involved in slanderous gossip, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, and that they admonish young women to love their husbands and love their children. That means First and foremost, the older women have loved their husbands and loved their children. That means they've laid their lives down for their husbands and children, that they are servants of their households. It says to be discreet, chaste, homemakers. Number one job for a woman is to be a homemaker, to make sure that that house is running smoothly. Good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be blasphemed. That is the job of the woman is to be obedient to their own husbands. Not to be at ease, just being rebellious, not taking care of the house, but to take care of the house and to obey their own husbands, that the word of God may not be blasphemed. A so-called daughter of God that is rebellious against God, therefore rebelling against her husband, not taking care of her house, 
not being chaste, not being discreet, can cause the word of God to be blasphemed. Now, Paul writes to Timothy about taking care of widows, but the problem with a young widow is that she wouldn't be doing anything. She's supposed to remarry and take care of a household. In 1 Timothy 5, but refuse to younger widows, for when they have begun to grow wanton against Christ, they desire to marry, having condemnation because they have cast off their first faith. And besides, they learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house, not only idle, but gossips and busybodies saying things which they ought not. Women at ease. That's what happens in America in 2020, 2021, and if the Lord tarries, 2022. A lot of women are at ease that claim to be women of God, and God's judgment will come upon them. They're at ease, and, and Paul's dealing with people that are widows, young ladies, that they should just remarry and take care of a house and take care of children, because if they don't, they will enter into sin. There is nothing good about being at ease. We need to learn to work. We need to learn to labor, and this includes women. And it says, besides, they learn to be idle. You can actually learn the art of being idle, the art of doing nothing, just idleness. It's sin. It's called being at ease. Being at ease is sin. You're called to work and do things. And besides, they learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house, not only idle, but gossips in busybodies. Can we say social media busybodies and everyone else's matter? You shouldn't have that much time saying things which they ought not. Therefore, I desire that the younger widows marry, bear children, and manage the house. A woman is to have a job. Marry, bear children, and manage the house. Make sure that house runs good. Give no opportunity to the adversary to speak reproachfully, for some have already turned aside after Satan. You can turn aside after Satan just being at ease. That, that is a way to turn after Satan. And here the daughters of Jerusalem are being rebuked, God is telling them through Isaiah, rise up, you woman already, get busy, get working, get loving God, take care of your families, manage your house, respect your husbands, hear my voice, you complacent daughters, give ear to my speech, complacent. Everything's just okay. And what are you called to do if you find yourself in a complacent area? Hear my voice, says God, and give ear to my speech, says God. Hear him, hear him, seek him, seek him, God, what do you want me to do? He'll speak to you. If you seek him with a sincere heart, he will speak to you. God, I'm complacent. Forgive me of my sins. Show me what to do. Now, this can be received two ways. Number one, you can receive it as, oh, I better hear God's voice. I've been complacent. I've been at ease. Or number two, they could be, well, you've discouraged us, Isaiah. We've tried really hard. You've, you've just discouraged us. You don't know what I do. Sometimes people, when they get rebuked, are just, oh, I've, I've been discouraged. Oh, you've hurt my feelings. I don't like the way you said that. This was a strong rebuke, especially to women who are more sensitive. He called them at ease. He called them complacent. He told them to hear God's voice. Give ear to God's speech. And those who are hard-hearted in sin will often say, well, I didn't like that. That discouraged me. You made me feel bad about myself. But those that are truly repentant will fall on their face and say, God, I, I need to hear your voice. I need to seek you. I need to know what you want me to do. I want to be busy doing your work. Two ways to take it. There's godly sorrow and worldly sorrow. Those that have worldly sorrow just produces death. They harden their heart to the message and get upset at the messenger. They don't give any heed to the message. They're just mad that the messenger spoke to them. But those that have true godly sorrow repent of their sin. Paul describes this in 2 Corinthians chapter 7. He says, For godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation, not to be regretted. But the sorrow of the world produces death. It's still sorrowful. Sorry they got hurt. But when someone has true godly sorrow, it produces repentance. That means a turning, an acknowledgement of sin, leading to salvation. It's not to be regretted. Hey, I felt bad when you said that, but it was right. It was true. I want to get right. I want to get right with God. But the sorrow of the world produces death. For observe this very thing, that you, were, that you sorrowed in a godly manner. What diligence it produced in you. What clearing of yourselves. What indignation. What fear. What vehement desire. What zeal. What vindication. In all things, you proved yourselves to be clear in this matter. When someone truly repents, you'll see the fruits of repentance. They have a zeal to do what's right. If someone says, I'm sorry and has tears, but they don't do anything, not godly sorrow. If someone says, Oh, well, I'm just having a tough time and you've made me feel bad. You discouraged me. You know what? Not true repentance. True repentance, you'll see zeal. 
You'll see a clearing of yourself. Why, man, I've been cleared. I had sin. I had a weight on me, but it's been cleared. You can see true godly sorrow. These women who are at ease, these complacent daughters are called to rise up and to hear God's voice and give ear to his speech. In a year and some days, you'll be troubled, you complacent women. For the vintage will fail, the gathering will come. Tremble, you women who are at ease. Be troubled, you complacent ones. Strip yourselves, make yourselves bare and gird sackcloth on your waists. People shall mourn upon their breasts and for their pleasant fields, for the fruitful vine. On the land of my people will come up thorns and briers. Yes, all of the happy homes in the joyous city. Because the palaces will be forsaken. The bustling city will be deserted. The forts and towers will become lairs forever. A joy of wild wild donkeys pastures of flocks until the spirit is poured out upon us from on high and the wilderness becomes a fruitful field and a fruitful field is counted as a forest and, and there you have this kingdom age again and as we get more and more familiar with these old testament prophecies of a kingdom and we have heard before about how israel is going to be very it'd be a very fruitful place during the kingdom reign so god's judgment is going to be upon israel until the spirit is poured out upon us that's the jewish people from on high that means the holy spirit will be sent to them in the wilderness becomes a fruitful field and the fruitful field counted as a forest the wilderness areas will be fruitful the fruitful field will be like a forest there is yet a kingdom age to come for the jewish people Now, when the church age started, the Holy Spirit was poured out upon God's people. However, this says, until the Spirit is poured out upon us from on high. Who, who is Isaiah speaking to? The Jews. Upon us. Speaking of the Jews. Not, not you and I, but the Jewish people, the nation of Israel. The Holy Spirit has not yet been poured out upon the nation of Israel, but there is a time when that whole nation will come to God, or those that are left on the earth, they will come to God. There will be that time. It describes it in Romans eleven twenty five. 25. For I did not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. That's the church age. The fullness of the Gentiles will come in. And then it's back on Israel. And yeah, people will come to faith in Christ through the nation of Israel. They, they will be the centerpiece of God for the kingdom age and during that tribulation period god will have the 144,000 male virgin jews like it, it's going to be eyes back on israel church age done in acts chapter 2 peter quoting the book of joel on the day of pentecost talks about the holy spirit being poured out upon them even though they're jewish people but it's upon the church age yet to happen to israel though in acts chapter 2 and verse 16 Peter preaching says, but this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it came to, it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And on my maid, sir, on my men servants, on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they shall prophesy. Prophesying is a sign you've got the Holy Spirit in you. That's the church age. Then in verse 19, because there's a pattern that we're going to see that I'm going to point out to you, that it goes from church age, God's Holy Spirit being poured out to tribulation, then kingdom. And you'll see that a lot in other places too. That goes church age, spirit poured out, tribulation, then another good time. So Peter quoting the book of Joel says, I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire, vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. Remember, the day of the Lord is the tribulation and the kingdom age. So right there, it says that will happen before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord, the actual coming of Jesus for the kingdom age. So how's it go? It goes, spirit poured out, church age, right? Church age, that's what happened on the day of Pentecost. Peter tells them, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. What you're seeing right here, we're speaking in tongues, we're prophesying. This is what it talked about. The Holy Spirit's being poured out upon us. Then he says, it talks about the tribulation period. I will show wonders in heaven above, signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire, vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, moon into blood. That's all the book of Revelation before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord, before he comes back. And it shall come to pass, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Yes, that's applicable to us right now, that if you call upon the name of the Lord, you shall be saved. But 
That's the kingdom age. If you call upon the name of the Lord, you're saved. Those who were born during that time, it's whoever calls, not just the Jews, but whoever. When we read this book here, and it says, until the spirit is poured out upon us from on high, and the wilderness becomes a fruitful field, and the fruitful field is counted as a forest, that us is the Jewish people, and the spirit will be poured out upon them eventually. Right now it's on the church, and I do believe at the rapture that the Holy Spirit is the restrainer that's taken out of the way, but somehow the Holy Spirit also comes and does a work among the Jewish people again. And they will do a work, and the Holy Spirit will be poured out upon them, and the kingdom age will shortly begin after that. Verse 16. Then justice will dwell in the wilderness, and righteousness remain in the fruitful field. The work of righteousness will be peace and the effect of righteousness quietness and assurance forever my people will dwell in a peaceful habitation in secure dwellings and quiet resting places a yet future time that is the kingdom though hail shall come down on the forest the city is brought low in humiliation blessed are you who sow beside all waters who send out freely the feet of the ox and the donkey chapter 33 verse 1 Woe to you who plunder, though you have not been plundered, and you who deal treacherously, though they have not dealt treacherously with you. When you cease plundering, you will be plundered, and when you make an end of dealing treacherously, they will deal treacherously with you. Most likely a prophecy of the Assyrians who have plundered, but then will be plundered, who have dealt treacherously, then they'll be dealt treacherously with, uh, with although it could also be describing a yet future time, when the kingdom of Antichrist is also dealt with and the Jews take what they had. Verse 2, O Lord, be gracious to us. We have waited for you. Be their arm every morning, our salvation also in a time of trouble. And here is this prayer that they pray out to God, the Jewish people during their time of trouble. O Lord, be gracious to us. We have waited for you. Be their arm every morning or be our arm every morning, our salvation also in a time of trouble, God, be gracious to us. O oh Lord, be gracious to us. God, give me favor I do not deserve. That is what that's saying. God, I don't deserve your favor, but grant me favor. When you pray for God's mercy and grace, who gets exalted? You or God? God gets exalted. When you pray for grace or you pray for mercy, it exalts God's character and nature but it makes you look bad because you need mercy and grace. Those who say, well, I'm good and I don't need that, well, that exalts the person and shows that God owes them a favor because they have been so good. But the person who gets to the point and says, oh, Lord, be gracious to me, or oh, Lord, be gracious to us, they're acknowledging that they need God's undeserved favor. They've acknowledged that God is good, they're not good, and they need God's favor. And that brings glory to God. Oh, God, be gracious to us. The Jews will cry that out. And I pray that you would cry that out when you find yourself in a place where you have not been walking with the Lord. You say, oh God, be gracious to me. That's an acknowledgement of your sin and that you need God's undeserved favor towards you. And if you cry out for grace and you cry out for mercy, you will get grace and you will get mercy. There's a parable that Jesus talks about in Luke 18. It says he spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. There's a problem here. And the problem isn't that he fasts twice a week. The problem is that he gives tithes. The problem is that there's no problem that he's not an adulterer. Those are all things they were supposed to do. He, he was obedient. The problem was he didn't think he needs God's mercy and grace. He trusted in himself. He thought he was good enough. God, I've done it. Now, yeah, you should be a righteous person. You should tithe. You should live for the Lord. You should do all that. But it's not a trusting in yourself and looking at the other person saying, I clearly deserve something and they don't. No, the person who comes to God with the right heart says, I do all this, Lord, but I need mercy and I need grace. I don't deserve to be in your kingdom, Lord. I just do this out of response to who you are and how great you have been. And the tax collector standing afar off would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. He asked for God's mercy. He confessed his sin. The same as we, 
We should do all the right things. We should live righteously. We should live holy. We should live after God. We should honor God with the first fruits of all of our increase. But still realize, God, I need mercy. God, I need grace. You don't owe me anything, God. The only thing I've deserved is your wrath. But because of the blood of Jesus Christ, please cover me. That's asking for mercy and grace. Acknowledging that God doesn't owe you a single thing. The only thing that you have earned from God is trouble. I have earned God's trouble. I have earned God's judgment. Even if you did something good, it just means you don't get punished for what you did good. But what do you do with all the bad you've done? Even if you're not as bad as the next guy, what do you do with your bad? Yeah, there's different levels of sin. There's different levels of bad. And you might not be nearly as bad as somebody else, but you've still done bad. You've still sinned. You've still done evil in God's eyes. What do you do with it? Well, that's where the blood of Jesus Christ comes in. And you pray, God, have mercy on me. Cover me by the blood of the Lamb of Jesus Christ. Wipe away my sins. We don't go to God and tell God how great we are and what he owes us. We go to God and say, I did this in response to how great you are, Lord, and God, please have mercy on me. So Jesus says, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Have mercy on me, Lord. God, please have mercy. That's all you pray. God, have mercy. Lord, have grace on me. O oh Lord, be gracious to us. We have waited for you. Be their arm every morning, our salvation, also in a time of trouble. God is not only a salvation for your soul, he's also just a, your salvation in this life. When the Jews are in trouble, whether it be the Assyrians or whether it be during the tribulation period and they need deliverance from the Antichrist's armies, God is their salvation, and he is your salvation today. You want protection from this evil government that's arising? You want protection from this vaccine? You want protection from those who have been vaccinated? You know, you know who your salvation is? God. God, be my salvation. Lord, save me from this mess. It's terrible. God, save me. Be my salvation. He wants you to trust in him. And if you don't trust in him, he'll probably make what you trust in fail. If you go to the world and you go to Egypt for their horses and all their great things that they have, listen, it won't work. Go to God. And if God leads you to do something or something health-wise, that's fine. But go to God. Let God be your salvation. God, be my salvation in a time of trouble. At the noise of the tumult, the people shall flee. When you lift yourself up, the nations shall be scattered. And your plunder shall be gathered like the gathering of the caterpillar as the running to and fro of locusts. He shall run upon them. The Lord is exalted, for he dwells on high. He has filled Zion with justice and righteousness. So there you have the kingdom age that's going to happen after God's judgment. Wisdom and knowledge will be the stability of your times and the strength of salvation. The fear of the Lord is his treasure. Surely their valiant ones shall cry outside. The ambassador of peace shall weep bitterly. Verse 8, the highways lie waste. The traveling man ceases. He has broken the covenant. He has despised the cities. He regards no man. The earth mourns and languishes. Lebanon is shamed and shriveled. Sharon is like the wilderness. And Bashan and Caramel shake off their fruits. Now I will rise, says the Lord, and I will be exalted, and now I will lift myself up. You shall conceive chaff, and you shall bring forth stubble. Your breath as fire shall devour you. And the people shall be like the burning of lime, like thorns cut, they shall be burned in the fire. Hear you who are far off what I have done. You who are near, acknowledge my might. The sinners in Zion are afraid. Fearfulness has seized the hypocrites. Who among us shall dwell with the devouring fire? Who among us shall dwell with the everlasting burnings? The sinners in Zion are afraid. Fearfulness has seized the hypocrites when God's judgment comes. The Bible tells us in Proverbs 28, 1, that the wicked flee when no one pursues, but the righteous are as bold as a lion. When God's judgment comes, those who are not right with God will truly tremble. And then we... We are righteous, righteous by faith. We can be as bold as a lion. I stand right with God. God knows my heart. He knows that I seek him. He knows that I love him. He knows that I'm repentant towards him. He knows that I want his mercy and his grace. I know that God has shown me his mercy and his grace. I know that God loves me. The righteous are as bold as a lion. We know. We know that we, we, we stand right with God. But the sinners in Zion are afraid. Fearfulness has seized the hypocrites, the hypocrite, the one who is just an actor or actress, and God sees right through their acting. 
Who among us shall dwell with the devouring fire? Who among us shall dwell with the everlasting burnings? It means who can stand in God's judgment? He who walks righteously and speaks uprightly. That's who can stand. Isaiah asks the question, who among us shall dwell with the devouring fire? That means a devouring judgment. Who among us shall dwell with the everlasting burnings, the judgment? And here is who can stand. It says, he who walks righteously and speaks uprightly. He who despises the gain of oppressions, who gestures with his hands, refusing bribes, who stops his ears from hearing bloodshed and shuts his eyes from seeing evil. The person who walks righteously and speaks uprightly. Yes, righteousness is of faith. In Genesis 15, 6, speaking of Abraham, and he believed in the Lord and he accounted to him for righteousness. Your righteousness is because you believe the Lord. You believe whatever his word says. And it's not always just about salvation. It's about everything the word says. You believe it. It's accounted to you for righteousness. However, there's no such thing as a person that is righteous that lives unrighteously. It's a contradiction. And the Bible talks about that. You have many false teachers that proclaim one saved, always saved. No, you can live unrighteously and you're so righteous on the day of judgment. No, it doesn't work that way. The person who lives unrighteously does not believe the word of God. They don't believe what it says. Those who practice unrighteousness simply do not believe what this book says. That's a fact. They live contrary to it. It talks about in the epistle of 1 John, if you have the seed of God in you, it says you cannot sin. That doesn't mean that you never do sin. It's talking about you cannot practice sin. That's what that means. If the seed of God is in you, if the Holy Spirit is in you, you cannot continually live in sin. Now, the person can get saved, and we see these examples, and then walk away from God, no longer have the Holy Spirit in them. But as long as the Holy Spirit remains in you, you cannot continually sin. You get convicted. You can't live that way. You just can't. It doesn't mean you never will sin. It means you cannot continually practice sin. But the righteous, the righteous have faith. They believe the Word of God. Whatever the Word of God says has authority over them. They don't try to take authority over the Word of God. Th those that claim that, oh, I said my prayer, I believe in God, don't judge me, are not righteous. Because they don't really believe everything the Word says. The Word talks about judging one another. 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 9, Paul writes, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? He's telling them, because the Corinthians are a little deceived, or a lot deceived on this. They have unrighteous people there. They had a sexually immoral man acting as if he was a brother in the Lord. So Paul has to straighten out. Don't you know that the unrighteous won't inherit the kingdom of God? He says, do not be deceived. Don't be deceived by this. I'm called not to be deceived. You're called not to be deceived. Because people will come in and say, oh, I'm saved. Don't be deceived. If they live unrighteously, they're not righteous. Don't be deceived. Don't be fooled. Don't willingly accept that as a Christian. Paul says, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. Just a fact. And such were some of you. Such were some of you. But then you got saved. So you're no longer that. But you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. When the Holy Spirit comes in you, you're a new creation in Christ. You're no longer an unrighteous person. You no longer live unrighteously, but you live righteously. And he who walks righteously, and he who speaks uprightly, we know that we're set. We are right with God. He who despises the gain of oppression, who gestures with his hands, refuses bribes. Those are the righteous people. They refuse bribes. That isn't the current day and age that we live in. How many politicians go in poor and come out rich? Most of them. There's one man, I don't consider him a brother in the Lord, but there's one man who I knew who became less wealthy as being president. And according to what I've read, that's Donald Trump. But the vast majority go in not that wealthy and come out very wealthy. It says that these are the righteous people who stop their ears from hearing of bloodshed and shuts his eyes from seeing. They are not part of it. He will dwell on high. His place of defense will be the fortress of rocks. Bread will be given him. His water will be sure. Your eyes will see the king in his beauty. They will see the land that is very far off. And here it is talking about that king once again. That king... In his kingdom, your eyes will see the king in his beauty. That beautiful king, Jesus Christ. We'll see him. 
the glorious king. When Jesus came the first time, there was no beauty that we should desire him, it says. But there is a time where they will see his beauty. Isaiah prophesied in chapter 53, speaking of the Messiah, for he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and, out of, and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness. And when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. The Messiah's first coming, there would be no beauty that you're like, this is it, this is the man. Good looking guy, I want to follow him. No real outward beauty. No real outward majesty to say he wasn't part of some huge kingdom with a castle. No, he was, he was a humble king. He comes back much different. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. That was in his first coming. But there's a second coming of this king when he comes to set up his kingdom on earth. And it says, your eyes will see the king in his beauty. That is yet to be seen. The king and his beauty. And it's not just an outward beauty. I believe it's all of his majesty. The majesty of his kingdom. The majesty of his authority. That God has come to dwell among men that way. And he will be here with his kingdom. They will see the land that is very far off. And some of these prophecies are, are hard to interpret exactly. But I do believe that the best interpretation is that, that all of the land of Israel will be established when the king is here. When they see him in his beauty, that all of the old borders given will be established your heart will meditate on terror where is the scribe where is he who weighs where is he who counts towers again prophesying some of the some of these verses the interpretation of the prophecy can be difficult however where it says your heart will meditate on terror I, I don't believe it to be a bad thing when the king is here but the terror that the jews have been through they will remember the things they, they had been through during the kingdom of antichrist and where is the scribe? Where is he who weighs? Where is he who counts towers? Probably a reference to those who are part of the kingdom of Antichrist are gone. You will not see a fierce people, a people of obscure speech beyond perception, of a stammering tongue that you cannot understand. Look upon Zion, the city of our appointed feasts. Your eyes will see Jerusalem, a quiet home, a tabernacle that will not be taken down. Not one of its stakes will ever be removed, nor will any of its cords be broken. But there... The majestic Lord will be with us, a place of broad rivers and streams in which no galley with oars will sail, nor majestic ships pass by. For the Lord is our judge, the Lord is our lawgiver, the Lord is our king, and he will save us. This is all prophecy to the Jews that there is a time when they're going to have the king with them. And again, I repeat from earlier in the sermon that that king is none other than Jesus Christ the Christ, the Messiah. They knew that he was the son of David. He knew, or they knew that he was this king. And this is the kingdom that we also look forward to, that we will be ruling and reigning with Jesus Christ in. We look forward to this kingdom. As much as we can get excited about little political things here, although it's not much at all as this thing sinks, but there is a true kingdom that we need to be excited about. This is it right here. You know, it's easy to deceive people and get a big ecumenical movement by saying, we got to join hands and save America. There's no saving America. It's already gone. It's done. We're a Sodomite nation. It's done. It's like the days of Lot, Sodom and Gomorrah. God's judgment's coming. You know, now that we've given up on the homosexual issue, now so let's stop transgenderism. Listen, there's no stopping this train. Just as there used to be little victories with homosexual marriage, there's little victories with, you know, transgender, which is just body mutilation. I'm using their language. It just means you've mutilated your body and you're a cross-dresser. You're not really a transgender. But anyways, now they say, well, they're not going to let them compete in sports. The fact that we're even having this battle shows you how far gone this place is. There's no saving it. It's done. They're saving some of the souls. That that's what we look forward to, getting ready for the kingdom. But this place is going down even if there appears to be little victories you know what kingdom it's leading to the kingdom of antichrist even if there appears to be a, a religious revival void of judgment because you can't have all this unity with judgment even if you see this religious revival void of judgment and we're also seeing the rise of calvinism more and more again set up the kingdom of God on earth. It's just next to Roman Catholicism. Calvinism is so close to Roman Catholicism and a lot of their theology. We're just seeing the revival of 
false Christianity. That's all. It's not true Christianity. It's just ecumenical movements in the name of saving America or in the name of coming together in the name of being a white hat. That, that is not the church. It's not the kingdom of God. But we look forward to this kingdom. But there, the majestic Lord will be with us. It's when God is actually with us and we are with him. A place of broad rivers and streams in which no galley with oars will sail, nor majestic ships pass by, for the Lord is our judge. The Lord is our lawgiver. The Lord is our king. He will save us. There's that day when he is present on earth and he is the king, he is the lawgiver, and he is the judge. And we'll look at two things, lawgiver and judge. God is indeed the true lawgiver. When you get into the Old Testament, who gave the law? God did. And you have three parts of the law. You have the ceremonial law which is not applicable to the church today, the circumcision, the Jewish holidays. But you have the moral laws. Honor your mother and your father. You shall have no other gods before me. Thou shall not murder. Thou shall not cover. Thou shall not steal. Those are all moral laws. And guess what? They're repeated in the New Testament. It is not called legalism when you preach them. You also have the civil laws. That's the third part of the law that you read about in the Old Testament. The civil laws, the laws of how to have government and what the government's supposed to do. And during the kingdom age, there will be laws. Jesus Christ will rule and reign, and he will be the lawgiver. He will be the king. He will be the judge. And even right now as Christians, we need to understand that what God's law says is right. Now, the ceremonial laws are not applicable to the church. If myself or any other preacher ever says, you need to believe in Christ plus be circumcised to be saved, or you need to believe in Christ plus observe the Sabbath or the full moons, you know what the Bible says? Let me be accursed and let them be accursed. But if I tell you, you need to honor your mother and your father, you need to love God, you cannot be a murderer, you cannot be a coveter, you know what? Praise God, because that's the truth. That's God's law. That's what it says. Those are his moral laws. If I sit here and tell you that certain actions, whether it be stealing or homosexuality or sin, and how do I know that? Because I'm created in God's image and I also have God's word. And I can tell you according to God's law, that those things are laws in, in, in the Old Testament. There are civil laws and breaking them is a sin. There are laws all throughout how to, how to run the nation of Israel. It's a sin to break those things. And so as Christians, we need to accept that, yeah, the Bible has laws. Laws are good. You have false Christianity today who says, well, there is no laws, and anytime you make up a law, you're judging me, and don't ever judge me. That's all heretical. It's false Christianity. We look forward to today where there's a king, a lawgiver, and a judge who does righteously. We look forward to all that. The king, the lawgiver, and the judge. And even as we're waiting for the kingdom of God, we have the law, and we're called the judge. Judgment's good according to God's law. In 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 12, for what do I have to do with judging those also who are outside? Do you not judge those who are inside? We're called to judge. It's a godly thing. God himself is a judge. It's absurd to say, oh, I don't judge. No, you need to judge. We judge those who are inside the church. But those who are outside, it says, God judges, therefore put away from yourselves the evil person. We have to judge. We have to say, you're not one of us. I judge because of these sins and you're out. We can judge and say, you don't have the Holy Spirit. You're out. We can judge and say, you practice drunkenness. And unless you repent, you're out. We judge. That's biblical. And how do we judge? According to God's law by his Holy Spirit. Yes, we look forward to that day when the king is here as the lawgiver and as the judge. But right now, by the Holy Spirit and in his presence, we judge people. 1 Corinthians 6 Paul, again, rebuking these Corinthians, he says, Dare any of you having a matter against another go to law before the unrighteous and not before the saints. The Corinthian church is actually going to the worldly courts to judge their matters. He says, Dare any of you do that? Dare any of you? You can't judge your own matters? He says, Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world will be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? If you're a saint, if you're born again, you're going to judge the world. You're going to sit with Christ in judgment someday. So this whole idea, this satanic of idea, I won't judge. It's satanic. It's evil. It's a twisting of scripture. Just as Satan tried to get Jesus to throw himself off the top of the temple and used the scripture and said, oh, he'll give his angels charge over you lest you dash your foot against a rock. 
Yeah, he quoted the scripture properly, but he misinterpreted and applied it. People read the scripture about judging, misinterpret, and misapply it. That's satanic. Oh, I don't judge. No, you're supposed to judge. If you're a Christian and you can't judge, something's wrong with you. Paul writes, do you not know that we shall judge the angels? How much more are things that pertain to this life? How do we judge? According to God's law. What does his law say? Well, that's what's right. We judge. If you then, or if then you, having judgments concerning things pertaining to this life, do you appoint those who are least esteemed in the church, by the church to judge? I say this to your shame. Is it so that there's not a wise man among you, not even one, who will be able to judge between his brethren? But brother goes to law against brother, and so before unbeliever. It is an absolute failure when professing Christians do that. The Lord is our lawgiver. The Lord is our king. The Lord is our judge. The one that people under the influence of the devil like to quote is Matthew chapter 7, where Jesus says, judge not that you be not judged. And people quote that a lot, especially unbelievers, especially fake Christians. And they judge it. The devil quotes scripture. It says, for with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with what measure you use, it will be measured back to you. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye and look at plank as your own eye? Hypocrite! First remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Who is Jesus rebuking? The hypocrite. The actor. The actress. The one who says, oh, I'm of God, but they live contrary to God. And they're out pointing out everybody else's sins while they're living in sin. That's the hypocrite. He doesn't say don't ever judge. He says, first, do this first. Remove the plank from your own eye. Then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Get your own plank out. Then you can actually judge righteously. Then you can judge. But if you're around judging and hypocrisy and the harsh judgment used towards others, it's coming back at you. Verse 23. Your tackle is loosed. They could not strengthen their mast. They could not spread the sail. Then the prey of the great plunder is divided. The lame take the prey. And it is most likely a prophecy of what happens to the stuff left over from the kingdom of Antichrist. The, the plunder is divided. The lame will take the prey. All those kingdoms brought to nothing. Verse 24. And the inhabitant will not say, I am sick. And the people who dwell in it will be forgiven their iniquity. The people who dwell in it will be forgiven their iniquity. And the inhabitant of that land, they're not going to say, I am sick. A prophecy of the kingdom of Jesus. You're not going to say, I am sick. And you'll also be forgiven. It tells us in Psalm 103, verse 1, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquities and heals all your diseases. The Lord is the one that forgives all of our iniquities and heals all of our diseases. And Matthew chapter 9 and verse 2, it says, And behold, they brought to him a paralytic lying on a bed. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, be of good cheer. Your sins are forgiven you. He can forgive sins. And at once, some of the scribes said within themselves, This man blasphemes. But Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Why do you think evil in your hearts? For which is it easier to say, Your sins are forgiven you, or to say, Arise and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, Arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. Jesus Christ, in his kingdom, the sick aren't going to go there and say, I am sick. The inhabitants will not say, I am sick. The people who dwell in it will be forgiven their iniquities. We look forward to that King Mage. Now, we will be in our resurrection bodies completely healthy, 100% new, no longer sinners. There will be the Jews that make it through the tribulation period, that will still be in natural bodies, but the lives will be prolonged during that time. And those inhabitants during that time will not say that they are sick and all their iniquities will be forgiven them. And even today, to find forgiveness of iniquity, how do you do it? Jesus. It's Jesus. And you can respond in two ways when your iniquity is confronted. One, you can harden your heart, play the victim that that message was mean, and you didn't like it, it made you feel bad, or you can say, I do have iniquity and I need forgiven. God, I need your mercy and I need your grace. 
None of us are yet without sin. <laughs> we're not perfected yet. We wait for that day to be perfected, but right now we're not perfected. We don't identify as sinners to say we identify as righteous, righteous by faith, trying to live a righteous lifestyle by the power of the Holy Spirit, but we are not yet without sin. We wait for that day. So as we get ready to take communion, take a moment to think about, God, I, I do have iniquity that needs to be forgiven. And here's a great thing. You will walk away justified. If you confess your sin to God, he will forgive. He will display his awesome mercy. He will display his awesome grace towards you. But if you harden your heart and say, well, I don't have sin. My sin isn't as bad as the next guy. I'm more righteous than that person out there. I'm good enough. Well, God will show you his awesome judgment, which is also awesome. He will judge you in a rather marvelous way. But it's your choice. You, you can either get mercy and grace or you can get judgment. And this is what's going on with the Jews. Mercy or grace or judgment. Which do you want? They chose judgment. They chose to harden their hearts. They chose to play the victim. They chose, oh, this message offends me. We don't want to hear it, Isaiah. Remember, Isaiah was to prophesy until the place was laid desolate and in waste. Early on, Isaiah went over, how long? He said, Lord, basically, and I'm going to paraphrase till it's all ruined. Keep on sending the message. I've seen that happen today. I've, I've repeated the same message over and over many times. Very, many times, very prophetically, I say things that I know only come from the Holy Spirit. I'll have knowledge, and I'm not boasting because this has nothing to do with me. I will say things, confront things that I can only know by the Holy Spirit. And yet I see people mad. They, the miraculous, they don't even give heed to it. They're not even like, how did that guy know that? There's only one way I can know certain things, by the Holy Spirit, because I don't know. I'm not that special. But you can know by the Holy Spirit. And I've had people just sit there and act as if nothing supernatural just happened. You confront their sin and something that only God would know and that I could only know by God's Spirit. And it's very supernatural, and yet they walk away hard-hearted. And that happens. And don't walk away today hard-hearted. Just hear the Word of God and say, God, I need mercy. I need grace. I don't want to be a complacent daughter. I don't want to be at ease. I, I want to be someone zealous for you. I want to be your zealous daughter. I want to be your zealous son. God, I want to look forward to your kingdom. There is a great kingdom yet to come. This is what the Jews were so anticipating. This is why they're so excited when Jesus is there. Hosanna, son of David, save us. Save us, son of David. You're the Messiah. All these prophecies of the kingdom, all throughout this book, there's no reason to be deceived. Yet there are many false teachers today, many of them Calvinists, because they just came out of the Roman Catholic Church. And there, there's so many similarities between the two. Maybe not in all their doctrines, but the whole idea of the kingdom here and now, infant baptism, all that stuff. But there's always a true believer who looks forward to the kingdom of God. And yes, you are born into the kingdom of God by the Holy Spirit, but... We still wait to see the kingdom of God set up on earth when Jesus Christ returns at his second coming. And it's all laid out in the Bible. Rapture, then you got the kingdom of Antichrist, which is God's judgment and wrath upon the world, and then the kingdom of Jesus Christ. It's, it's the order. So let us not be deceived today, too, as we do see the foundations being laid for the kingdom of Antichrist. Whether it's through these immunity passports, which they can track and trace everybody. And I know there's little victories or pockets of victories here and there. And maybe we'll see more pockets, but it's going to come. It will, it, it's tracking, tracing, everyone having a mark that you can't buy, sell, or trade without. It's coming. The Bible says so. And the whole idea of a religious revival, it's coming. The Bible talks about the anti. It's coming. So yes, when people are saying the white hats are going to win, yeah, yeah. And here's the, here's the wild part. Everyone's going to be appeased. Everyone's going to like them. It's going to be a worldwide liking, a worldwide unification, starting with the peace covenant with Israel. So Israel is going to be a mess. And I am absolutely 100% pro-Israel. Why? Because the Bible gave that land to the Jews. Right now, though, I fully understand that the Jews are enemies of the gospel according to the Bible. They're enemies of the gospel. They're spiritually not my friend. But I love them but I'm pro-Israel. I know that land belongs to them. They're God's chosen people. We, 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 our faith in Christ came out of them, out of that nation. So I fully support them. But understand, spiritually, they're, they're Sodom and Egypt right now, according to the scripture. They're spiritually not good, but they'll unite with everybody. They'll unite with the Antichrist. They'll unite with the false church. It's coming. Someone's going to come in and look like their friend. 
And then the Antichrist turns on them. So it'll be amazing. As we watch these things get set up, and in the meantime, in the meantime, I, I know what God has prepared me for and is preparing me for is for a harvest. I know it. All, all these 12 years I've been here, through the wilderness, it's been tough. Many people, it, it's obscure. There's only one reason why I'm still doing this, because I stand by the Holy Spirit. That's the only reason. I, I don't have this supernatural strength within myself to go through the trials I have been through and stand here with joy and strength that I have, except by the Holy Spirit of God. He has sustained me and will continue to sustain me. But there is a harvest to come, and this isn't going to be this ecumenical harvest. I have not been raised up by God to be an ecumenical leader. I've been raised up by God to be more like John the Baptist. When I see the Pharisees and Sadducees coming, call them a generation of snakes. That is my calling, and that's what I'll do when the time comes. And I know that the few of us here that have withstood some of these trials and storms, that you're going to have to stand too. We're not here to make friends in the world. We're here to be obedient to God and to be a friend of God like Abraham was a friend of God. Just say, God, I, I, I am your servant. I know you. God, I love you. I, I will choose you above everybody and everything else. Jesus, he came here not to do his own will, but the will of the Father who sent him. It is not our job to build a social club. It's not our job to build numbers. God will build his church. Jesus Christ will build the church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. We only have one job today. Number one is to love God. I say one job. It's one job, but it has several things. It's to love God and to do his will. That's it. Love God, do his will. Love God, do his will. Wake up in the morning, love God, do his will. God, what's your will for me today? First and foremost, love him. That means walk with him. That means know him. That means seek him out in the word and in prayer. And number two says, God, saying, God, what do you want me to do? I'm your servant, Lord. I will serve you today, no matter what it is. And that's not always this easy thing in this world. Sometimes it's a hard job. You say, God, I will serve you in this matter. So let's get ready to take communion, examining our hearts, saying, God, I want to serve you. I want to love you. And I want to look forward to your kingdom. Let's remember Jesus Christ in doing this. And that this represents that our sins were wiped clean because God came down here in the flesh to die for our sins. He came down here to be punished God the Son, by God the Father, he came here to be punished by him, to have the iniquities of all of us laid upon him so we could take on his righteousness. On the day of judgment, you will be righteous. Lord, I thank you. God, search our hearts and know us. Lord, for we have sinned. Forgive us of our iniquities, our adulteries, Lord. Our God, just everything we've done, Lord, our wickedness, our sinful thoughts. Lord, I thank you for your mercy and your grace that you have done these things, Lord, that you have cleansed us, that you have patiently dealt with us. May partake. Lord, I thank you for the shed blood of your son, Jesus Christ. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. There's no sin put away. I thank you that you made a way for us, Lord. You may partake. Lord, pray you be with us, Lord, that we will love you, seek you, do your will. And Lord, we do pray, come quickly. In Jesus' name, amen.